George's Island, a National Historic Site in the middle of the Halifax Harbour. For us, it was our second time here during the first summer it had been open in more than five years. Not having a boat ourselves, we hopped aboard the Harbour Queen, a shuttle to the island by day, a party boat by night. Pulling away from the dock, we became excited to head back to the island. We had been here a few weeks before on a semi-private tour of the island. Here, we joined others as we had a tour of the famous tunnels on the island. Although we won't go into it here, be sure to check out our other video regarding this experience. As we made our way across the harbour, we reflected on some of the stories we read, including a theory that tunnels existed underwater to connect the island with the mainland, straight to Citadel Hill, a fort overlooking the city. Although our guide didn't quite confirm the theory, he did allude that he was researching the topic and had found evidence that supports this theory, including eyewitness accounts and plans for such a tunnel. No matter where you go on the boat, you'll have a view. One of our favorite parts about visiting the historic site is the ride over. You have a 360 degree view of the city with Dartmouth on one side and Halifax on the other. You'll likely get a glimpse of why Halifax was rated as one of Canada's top cities and why people are flocking here from around the world. Construction cranes dot the skyline and new developments around the waterfront are always unfolding. Pleasure craft like this small boat can almost always be seen in the harbor and when they're not, you may see a container ship coming with goods or the Canadian Navy sailing onto the next mission. Halifax Harbour is busy, and it's this constant action that keeps locals wanting more. Pulling up to the island, you'll disembark from the ship. Your payment for the boat ride over also includes a mission to the site, as well as a tunnel tour. One price covers it all. Should you come with your own boat, you'll also pull up to the same dock, but you'll need to pay to get to the island at a temporary tent located at the entrance. Our first stop on the island brought us to the submarine mining establishment and the gun cotton tanks. We had learned a bit about this area on our first trip in by listening to a very knowledgeable guide. Uh, right down here we have the submarine mining establishment and this is from the 1800s, the 1870s I believe is when they, they started this. So what we have is a series of buildings that go along the shore. Look at this one that's all busted up over here. This one was used for assembling submarine mines. And how submarine mines worked back in the 1800s, these were big uh, metal cylinders filled with explosives that they actually put underwater in the harbor. They had apparently thousands of these things throughout Halifax Harbor. And how they worked is the explosives were rigged up to a little wire that went down to a weight at the bottom of the harbor. And all these wires went back onto shore where there was a control panel and somebody up there was watching to see if any enemy ships came floating in over a particular submarine mine. They could actually electrically detonate that mine from shore and blow the ship 10 stories into the air. Hmm. And not all in one piece as you could imagine. <laughs> and, and I know this because I got this firsthand. I read a, a, a diary that someone wrote who said they were visiting Halifax in the 1880s, I think, and they were sitting on the green slope of land right below that red brick building right over there. They said we were right behind the hospital and they said we watched one of these boats get blown up. They're going to do it instead of fireworks on, on natal day or something like that. And they said not only did this boat get blown into twigs, but they also said that they, these people having a picnic back there, they said the ground shook underneath them even though these, this thing was going off underwater. And this is the only submarine mining establishment that still exists. Is that still a fact? They, have never, they haven't found one, have they, Hal? I think so. There's one in Auckland, but it's gone. There was Good, one in Bristol. because this is now the only is one. This is what we can now claim exclusivity. Right over here, those uh, roofless uh, buildings over there, those are actually tanks for storing the explosives. They used uh, nitrocellulose, it's called gun cotton was the explosive. Oh, yeah. And to safely store it, you have to keep it damp. So they actually used to fill those tanks up with water while the nitrocellulose, the gun cotton, was inside and then they would pull a plug at the bottom of it and all the water would pour out and then they'd, they'd check and they go, oh, yeah, these things are nice and damp and you'd have to check them every couple of weeks. You go, let's see, oh, they're not damp. We have to fill the gun cotton tanks up. 
And there's various buildings over there. There's laboratories and there's test pits for like, for uh, exploding, or uh, for like testing out the primers that actually set off the, uh, the the submarine mines. As we start to go up the, the side of the hill to get a little bit closer to Fort Charlotte proper, which is up on top of the island, we uh, are going to pass by a little magazine that is on the right. It's a magazine. It's a dry primer store. So that's the the uh, the, the thing like a little friction tube type of thing that sets off the the submarine mine, so you can have a peek at that. I won't take the entire group in there because it's a little cramped, but feel free to have a look around. Taking his advice, we headed to the dry primer storage. As he mentioned, the dry primer storage was a structure built in the 1890s as part of a submarine mining establishment. It stored the detonators to fire the mines, which would have been filled with dry gun cotton. A sentry guard would have been posted here at all times of the day. I often try and imagine what it would have looked like back in the day. Bare walls are all that exist now, but it must have looked very different as it approached the 20th century. Moving up the hill towards Fort Charlotte, we came across the married officer's quarters and the remains of a former prison shed located in the background. The married officer quarters were built in 1901 for the officer in command of the island garrison. The house contained its own kitchen, a parlor, two bedrooms, and a sentry post for their own private guard. It was intended to house at least one officer and his family at a time, and was considered quite spacious compared to the barracks within the fort. Our next stop along the route was the lighthouse keeper's house. Not much information was available about this building, but as you can imagine, the role of the lighthouse keeper was vitally important. Based on information at other lighthouses we've been to in the past, chances are the lighthouse keeper and his family lived on site. Located just outside the lighthouse keeper's home are the famous red chairs of Parks Canada. Here, you can sit, relax, and enjoy some of the best views within the historic site. As we sat, we thought about the message on the Acadian interpretive panel, located just a little further up the hill. The Acadians are descendants of French settlers who founded Port Royal, Nova Scotia in the early 1600s. Despite an ongoing state of war, as France and Britain fought for control of the area, Acadians developed a distinct history and culture. They called this land Acadie. From 1755 to 1764, British authorities deported more than 10,000 Acadians in the interest of creating an English Protestant colony and taking ownership of their fertile lands. Properties were seized, buildings razed, and families torn apart. Many of the deportees ended up in Louisiana, USA. Approximately 1,000 Acadian men women and children were imprisoned on George's Island, housed in two sheds and often exposed to the elements. For the Acadian community, George's Island is a sacred site. It's a tangible connection to the human tragedy that played out about 250 years ago. As we continued up the hill, we reached the lighthouse, a beacon for safety formerly used in the harbor. Today, ships are guided in by the harbor master. Looking up the harbor, you can see the area has the ability to host a lot of container ships in addition to the cruise ships that frequent these waters. Across the lighthouse is Fort Charlotte, the central military fort for which the island is inhabited. Under orders of Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, the fortifications on George's Island were rebuilt completely in the 1790s. The name Fort Charlotte dates from this period after Edward's mother, Queen Charlotte. The fort was significantly rebuilt once again in the 1860s and represented one of the best examples of late Victorian artillery technology in Canada. The first structure you come to when entering the fort is the gate and guard house. The guard room and prison lockup was constructed in 1866 as part of Fort Charlotte's reconstruction. The room was a temporary home for the daily guard detail who controlled access to the gate and provided security and administrative services for the fort. The lockup or holding cells were for short-term incarceration of soldiers arrested for military crimes. 
A retractable bridge spanned the ditch and was controlled from within the guardroom. A wide open space constitutes the parade square, the location where troops would meet for roll call and drills. On the very edges of the parade square was the North Battery. The North Battery and its perimeter walls were among the oldest surviving features of Fort Charlotte. Constructed during the Napoleonic era, this battery originally mounted 10 24-pounder smoothbore guns. The battery was rebuilt in 1861 to accommodate eight 68-pounder smoothbore guns. Off to each side were caponiers, a topic talked about during our tunnel tour. So any enemy would have to send their soldiers running up the sides of George's Island, climbing down that outer wall that you see, that you're looking at right there, see that right there? And they'd have to run across the grass that you see there, and have, they'd have to climb up that inner wall. Well, while they were doing that, they might go with you know, hooks or ropes or ladders or whatnot. They were being shot at from inside this room here, which is called a caponier or, or a caponier, depending how you want to pronounce it. So uh, you can see here these windows are actually called loopholes, and they're designed specifically to have muskets and rifles shooting at them. The small building off to the side was the forge. This building was constructed during 1873 and 1877 for use by a specialized blacksmith. With this, a stick of iron and steel would be used to repair ordnance and equipment. Next to the forge, the artillery store and RML lab. RML standing for rifle muzzle loading guns. Toward the back of the island, you'll come to the upper battery. Fort Charlotte was reconstructed in 1860 to house the newly developed rifled muzzle loading guns. The semicircular shape of the battery meant that the seaward-facing guns provided a curtain of fire across the harbor channels to the east and west of George's Island. In this section, you will see things like a 9-inch RML gun and the quick-fire guns. Back in 1902, two 4.7-inch caliber breech-loading quick-fire guns valued for their accuracy and rate of fire were mounted in three of the upper batteries. The QF, or quick-fire guns, protected the minefield and the inner harbor and countered the threat of high-speed enemy torpedo boats. Around the rear of the island were a host of elevator shafts leading from the tunnels and underground storage facilities to the surface. A large ditch and even more caponiers lined the outer walls discouraged the approach from the entrance of the harbor. We thought this was smart Every important building was hidden away from the entrance of the harbor. It would have taken a lot of work for a boat to get around to the important parts of the island. Just because they could see the island doesn't mean attacking was feasible. We love that we took the time to explore this great National Historic Site. The fact that it had been closed off to the public for so many years made this place extra special. As we headed back to the city of Halifax, we took a moment to remember those who lived on this island before the Europeans arrived to settle the area, our very own indigenous community, the Mi'kmaq. The Mi'kmaq have always gathered in Jibuktuk, meaning the Great Harbor. Mi'kmaq archeological sites and place names for the islands and shores around us, from Turtle Grove to Bedford Basin. Jibuktuk has always been a key gathering place and harvesting area within the larger Mi'kmaq territory of Mi'kma'ki. When the English established their own town of Halifax in 1749, the Mi'kmaq nation saw this as a violation of their treaty obligations and resisted the new settlement. Mi'kmaq chiefs wrote, This place where you built your fortress is my land. The Creator gives me my territory forever. The conflict ensued until the Leave of Friendship Treaties in 1760 to 1761. The Mi'kmaq nation is still here, despite radical discrimination, land encroachment, and other breaches of the treaty. George's Island is a part of Mi'kmaq history as well. The Mi'kmaq call it Albakui Tukuk, meaning water splashed on it by the waves. Want to learn more about George's Island or other amazing places across the globe? Why not join us for more videos by subscribing or visit us online at joshuatravelguy.ca.